Okay, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. It's a pleasure. Um, so, uh, before I forget, everything I'm talking about today is joint with Jake Rasmussen and Liam Watson. And Jake was here last week and he gave a talk in the first mini conference. And I realized that there's very, um, very high overlap in the audiences. So, um, apologies for, for some repetition near the beginning uh, if you were here last week. Although I assume the summer school students won't mind seeing the basic definitions again um, and, and the key results. And to keep things fresh, um, so I'm talking about the same basic machinery that Jake spoke about, uh, which is a, sort of a new way of thinking about and working with bordered floor homology. Um, but I'll, f I'll focus on a different subset of applications. So this sort of machinery leads to a lot of nice applications about Hagrid floor homology of closed three manifolds. Uh, and I'll talk about different ones. So if you were here last week, Jake gave some nice applications to classifying L spaces. Um, I won't talk about L spaces at all today, but um, you know, maybe just mention that there are some other nice results about L spaces that some of us heard about last week. Um, okay, so uh, I guess to start off broadly, um, well, uh, I'm interested in manifolds and I'm interested especially in, in Hagrid floor homology, so everything in this talk is sort of gearing towards developing tools to better understand Hagrid floor homology of, of three manifolds. And I think we're all probably comfortable with Hagrid floor for closed three manifolds. Um, so I guess broadly speaking, the question I want to discuss is, so what are the Hagrid floor invariants For manifolds with boundary. Um, and a secondary question is, uh, assuming I have a good way of talking about Hagrid floor for manifolds with boundary, if I glue two of those manifolds together to get something closed, how do I recover the closed invariant? Okay, so these are sort of broad questions I want to discuss. Um, and um, it's worth just saying up front that everything I'm saying today is, is a, I, I'm not dealing with arbitrary boundary yet, at least everything I'm saying today applies to the torus boundary. So. Okay, now, to be clear, I'm not trying to claim that these questions haven't been answered before, and I'm uh, giving a first answer. Um, in, in, in particular, bordered floor homology, which has been around for a while, is uh, a nice answer to these questions, and it's at least, you know, it's at least an answer, um, and, then, and there maybe are some other ways of thinking about it as well, but that's definitely the answer that I'm going to build on. Um, but I guess what I'm doing is I'm trying to present a new and improved answer to this question in the case of torus boundary. So in a sense, the question I'm answering is, no, really, what are Hegard floor invariants for manifolds with torus boundary? Right? Like, well, how should I, what are these objects? How should I think about them? And um, by the end of the talk that uh, this, this formalism is really like the right way to think about these. It's very user friendly. Uh, it's a lot less intimidating than the initial definition of bordered floor homology. And it leads to some nice proofs of some nice applications. Um, okay, so um, with that buildup, maybe I should just tell you uh, what these invariants are and how you should think of them. So here's the first theorem. Um, So there's an invariant um, sorry, I guess I should say that M is a three manifold and I'm gonna pick a base point in the boundary um, for convenience. Um, okay, so now the theorem is that There's an invariant, which I'm going to call H of hat of M. 
And what is this invariant? It's a collection of immersed curves. Um, in punctured torus, uh, specifically in the boundary minus the space point. Um, and these curves are possibly decorated Um, I'll say what that is later, and uh, I'll also mention that in practice, most of the time these aren't necessary. Um, so don't worry too much about it, but um, this is what we have. Uh, okay, so these are curves defined up to homotopy, where the homotopies aren't allowed to go through this base point. Okay. Great. So um, I'll say more about where these come from later, but maybe I should start by showing you some examples. So the easiest manifold with torus boundary I can think of is the solid torus D2 cross S1. And in this case, H of hat of M is just, uh, well, it's the boundary of one of these disks. So uh, here's my solid torus. And this curve on the boundary is the H of hat of M. And Z is somewhere out here. It doesn't really matter where it is for this example. OK, so that was a pretty boring example. Like, but uh, let's do one that's a little more uh, a little more interesting. Uh, so M is going to be S3 minus um, the right-handed triangle T23. So this not complement. Now, I'm not going to draw the manifold. because That's a little hard. I'm just going to draw the, uh, the boundary. So I'm just going to draw the boundary. And I'm going to cut it open in there because that's the easiest way to draw it. So this is the boundary of the manifold. Notice to cut it open in a square, I had to make some implicit choice of curves to cut along. And I'm going to is the standard curves. This is the longitude, and this is the meridian. Um, so with that understanding, this, this, by the way, this point here is my base point Z. And now I have an immersed curve in the complement of Z. It happens to look like this. So this is H of hat. Um, okay, so uh, I'll draw pictures like times in the square, but putting that sometimes it's convenient not just to cut the torus open, but to lift to a covering space. Um, so. Um, In the trefoil example, I'm going to get the z-fold cover of this punctured torus where I keep the, um, the, the lambda direction wrapping around, but the mu direction I can roll. So this is mu, the circle is lambda, and this curve looks like that. Okay. If I were to do the same thing over here, I just get a simple circle. OK. Um, I'll try to show a couple more. Um, so I can take the complement of the figure eight knot. I'm just going to draw the cylinder. This actually has two components. One of them looks just like the solid torus, just a circle that wraps around. 
And the other one, uh, satisfyingly enough, is a figure eight that winds around these two pegs. Okay. Um, okay, I should maybe say something about how to, why can I lift to this cylinder, or what exactly is this cylinder? Well, there's, a, of course, a higher lift to the plane minus the lattice. That's the third covering space of the torus. Uh, mod out by the action of lambda, where lambda I think of as an element of the boundary, of each one of the boundary, it's the homological longitude. So what I mean by that is it's the, it's the, the generator of the kernel of the inclusion of this into H1 of M. It's the curve on the boundary that bounds something. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the cipher longitude for a not complement is always that. Lambda is always what's going to be going around this circle. This is relevant for this sort of last interesting example, um, which is, I guess I will denote d2 minus 2, um, or maybe depending on conventions, it should be 1 half minus 1 half. This is a cipher fibered space over the disk with two comb points of order 2. Um, okay, so this is some nice cipher fibered space. It's relatively simple. Um, it has other descriptions as well, but it's not so important. So I'm just going to show the curves. Okay, so this again has two components, uh, and one of them just wraps around, kind of like the solid torus, but there's a difference here that this cylinder actually has two um, columns instead of one. The other curve sort of winds between them. Okay, now why are there two columns? This is because this manifold has an order two homological longitude. So when I take homological longitude, I get a you know, width two or circumference two cylinder instead of a circumference. So that, that can happen. Um, maybe it's worth drawing this one in the torus. So if I project these down to the torus, now notice they're going to wrap around twice. So I get that and I get that. Okay, the last observation is that um, these two different components are from different spin C structures. And so, you know, I'll just point out that like the closed invariant, uh, HF had a, um, splits over spin C structures. So there's, so if I have multiple spin C structures, I'm definitely gonna have multiple components of this curve. Now, I can have multiple components in the same spin C structure. That happens here. There's only one spin C structure for figure eight, but I still get two components. Okay, but it's nice to know that I, I can talk about the curves just for a manifold with a spin C structure. By the way, if I ever forget to say this, my, one of my convention in this talk is that M will be a manifold with torus boundary and Y is a closed manifold. Um, okay. Uh, great. Um, okay, so the last piece of this, so I gave you some examples. None of these examples had this, were decorated by this local system, and that's because these local systems aren't that common, but let me just tell you that um, a local system is uh, a vector space um, f to the k and an automorphism of that vector space um, and by the way uh, f is always z mod two. Um, okay so this this can come up, but um, but it doesn't come up in, in fact, we don't know of any examples where you require 
a non-trivial local system. Here you think of this as just the dimension one local system with the trivial automorphism. Okay, so that's uh, invariant is, but I mentioned that we want to talk about closed manifolds, and so we want to answer the second question, how do we recover HF hat of a glued manifold when I glue? Um, and there's a nice characterization of that in terms of these curves, so here's the second part of our sort of main theorem. Let's let mi be a three manifold with boundary of mi a torus um, and a base point zi here for i is one or two. Okay, and let's let h from boundary of m1, m2, boundary of m1 be an orientation reversing gluing map. And it should take uh, the base point to the base point. Well, the theorem is that H of of Y, which is M1 union M2 glued with this gluing map, That's isomorphic to the floor homology of, um, well, I want two sets of curves in the punctured torus to take floor homology of. Um, on the one I have this invariant H of hat of M1. This lives in the boundary of M1. On the other side, I have H of hat of M2, which lives in the boundary of M2, but I'll just map that into the other boundary branch of these curves. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, this conference is all about symplectic and my, my secret is that I'm not that great at symplectic geometry, but I am pretty good at it in a two-manifold. So that's why I like this result. I, I can manage that, right? I can take Lagrangian floor of curves in a surface. Now, you might be thrown off a little by the fact that these are immersed. That doesn't actually really change anything important. Um, or systems kicking around, and that's not a big deal either. Um, but maybe just let's um, maybe it's worth taking the time to quickly say what I mean by floor homology of curves. Um, Well, like usual in floor homology, it's, uh, it, well, it's the homology of a chain complex generated by intersection points and differential counts immersed bygones whose boundary are on the two curves. Um, okay, so what do we do with local systems? Well. The best way to explain it, and, and this will be a little more rigorous later, I guess, but this is not super rigorous now, but we can interpret um, a dimension K local system, or you know, a curve with a dimension K local system, as K parallel copies of the curve. And then um, the boundary of are somehow allowed to sort of jump the tracks between these parallel curves. Uh, according to this automorphism. Okay, let's see. Uh, yes. I want to keep this up for a while, so. Yeah, I, uh, I know that I might not get that down, but I'm going to 
I'm, I'm going to relegate things that I want to leave up till the end of the talk, I guess, up there. Um, OK. Uh, OK, so you know, maybe that'll be more clear in some examples later. But um, uh, the last thing to say is that there's some admissibility, which, like usual, is that there shouldn't be any annuli. So no mercy. Um, also, fails that don't contain the puncture. Um, by the way, I, I should say we count bygones that don't cover the puncture. OK, but what's nice about this is that I can homotope the curves until they're in minimum position. And then there's going to be no bygones. There's going to be no differential. And since there's no bygones, I don't have to worry about this jumping bit. So the local system doesn't matter. Um, and I'm just counting intersection, the minimal intersection number of the curve. So OK, so we get uh, vector space of dimension uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2, where these are the two. Yeah, I should say that. So we just get the minimal intersection number, where, again, I, I count them with multiplicity in the sense that, that I said here. If there's a local system, I treat it as parallel copies of the curve. Um, but I, uh, it's just that unless I happen to have some immersed annuli, because um, then I have to mess things up to, to be admissible. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly what we do. I'll just say that we get some correction term if gamma 1 is parallel to gamma 2 which really doesn't come up all that often. So um, really, to get Hagrid floor homology of this glued manifold, um, I just need to um, I just need to count intersection points of curves. So let me quickly show you an example of that very quickly. Um, So let's say that M i are both um, complement, and I want um, mu one to be glued to uh, lambda two. Sorry, no, I want mu one to glue mu two plus lambda two to glue to. U2, so this specifies my gluing map. So I'm going to work in boundary of M1, where that's lambda 1, that's mu 1, as before. And I'm going to have this curve. Um, but now I also want to take another copy of this curve but then um, sort of glue it onto itself by this orientation reversing diffeomorphism, which is supposed to take um, let's see. so it's, this is supposed to be mu2, and this is supposed to be mu2 plus lambda2. Um, and you can work out what that does. Looks like this. You can check that um, this is in minimal position, so there's no bygones. There's no differential if I do the floor chain complex. And I just count intersection points. Um, and that means that dimension of HF hat of this glued manifold is 5. So it's pretty easy, at least in small examples, to compute with this. We're just drawing curves and seeing where they intersect. Uh, OK, so I can make a shape. Um, so we have these invariants. I want to tell you uh, a little bit, without getting too technical, about where they come from. Um, so let's see if we can do that. Uh, I already mentioned at the beginning that you know, these are not um, 
brand new invariants out of nowhere. These are defined using b the bordered flow. Those defined by Lipschitz, Hasselhoff, and Thick. So, okay, so there's bordered floor. Lipschitz, Osbeth, and Thurston. For arbitrary boundary, but I'm focusing on the torus boundary case. And I'm not really going to give you any details, but I'm just going to say that to a, a manifold M with boundary uh, and uh, a parameterization, which I'll call P. And what do I mean by that? I just mean a map from some standard torus, meaning a, a torus with some fixed choice of parameterizing curve, like you know, I implicitly have any time I cut it open as a square. So from a standard torus to the boundary. So given a manifold of boundary and one of the positions, they associate uh, something called over some algebra, I'll call it the torus algebra because it's defined in terms of the, the torus, um, that's what they get. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna actually define any of this though because it would kind of take the rest of the talk probably, but just the point is that there's some algebraic object, it's called a type D structure, it's more or less equivalent to a differential module, so these are things you may or may not have seen, if not, it's okay, um, but we get some algebraic structure. And then we're supposed to be able to pay, right? So um, this one here too. So um, the other key piece of their theory is that H of hat of M1, M2 uh, is recovered by some algebraic pairing operation on these modules. Called the box tensor product. So some type of tensor product. Again, I'm not defining this. I'm just telling you there is some algebraic invariant and some algebraic pairing that they define. And if you've seen it before, you know, it can be a little intimidating. Um, so the point is that uh, we actually, we just take these objects and say, hey, they can be reinterpreted as immersed curves with local systems. And for the most part, this is a break statement. It's not a statement about manifolds, it's a statement about any type D structure over this particular algebra. Um, there is one input, one more input from topology that we need, um, which they proved, it's, it's my terminology, but they proved that um, there's one constraint on the type D structures that come from a manifold on all type D structures. Um, and the term I'll use for that is that it's extendable. And what this means roughly is that it can be extended to a, um, to a bigger type D structure. over a bigger algebra, um, I'll call it tilde, but again, I won't um, Okay, so the point is that we're, we're looking at the, the category of type D structures with this one constraint. And now what we're gonna do is uh, uh, And this is really the, the, the piece of proving our theorem one that um, type D structures over A um, up to the relevant equivalence, homotopy equivalence class, um, these are equivalent immersed curves with local systems in this partridge torus. Um, 
Okay, so that's kind of the key ingredient. Um, and I'm already being very handy with you, right, because I'm not defining anything. Uh, I want to I want to go uh, keep hand waving a little bit and give you a sense of how we prove this, um, but I want to do that um, using uh, using basically a series of pictures. I won't even call it a proof sketch; it's more just like a representative example. Um, so, oh, where? So, um, it's, it's okay. So, um, remember, this is just very, um, uh, very much a sketch, and go to understand the sort of get the big picture. Um, do that with. Well, very big pictures, I guess. Um, kind of important to use such a big projector screen, I guess. Um, although, all I really wanted to do was find some excuse to draw a, a giant diagram that covered all nine chalkboards, but I figured spending 30 minutes doing it a great use of your time. So, um, okay, so here's a picture. This is a type D structure over the torus algebra. Again, I'm not going to define it. Some of you may know what that means. If you don't, it's OK. I guess what I will say is that whatever this algebraic object is, one of the standard ways of writing it down is by a directed graph like this. So a directed graph like this uh, encodes a type D structure. Um, the vertices are supposed to correspond to generators of this module. And then notice that they come in two flavors. That has some meaning in a type D structure. It relates to the item of the algebra. But if you haven't seen that, just think, oh, graphs that have two, color, two different colored vertices. Um, and the arrows are labeled by algebra elements. I didn't define the algebra, but roughly the elements are increasing sequences of the numbers one, two, three. And you know, an arrow is supposed to give me a term in the differential. Um, but a type D structure is, you could think of it as a graph like this with some constraints and up to some equivalence, because there's, there's more than one graph for the same type D structure. Here's the key idea of what we're going to do. Take this graph, and I'm going to um, immerse it in the torus. Uh, so I've cut, I have a, a standard torus, so a chosen base of, uh, a, a chosen set of curve, of two curves to cut along to get a square. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, all the black vertices are going to give me horizontal segments in this upper left quadrant. The white vertices are going to give me vertical segments in this lower quadrant. It, all the arrows are going to connect the corresponding segments um, but, you know, there's multiple ways to do that. I can connect these two going this way, or I can connect them going this way, and which you do depends on the label. So, for instance, this red arrow, a row three is always going to, a, a three is always going to be the top left corner. A one is always going to be the bottom right corner, and a two is always going to be the bottom left corner, and so on. You do this with all of them, and you get this. So, this is essentially the same graph, except I guess I've expanded the vertices into these segments. You could contract them if you want to. So it, it's roughly the same graph. I kind of, at the expense of having to embed this in the torus, I, I now no longer have to keep track of the labels on the arrows, because that's encoded by how they go. Um, and I might as well assume that, uh, that things are sort of all tangent. So all the vertices happen on these dotted lines um, right now. And I can assume that they're all sort of mutually tangent. So a graph that has that property is called train track. So this is, I'm actually working now with train tracks, and train tracks are nice because it makes sense to talk about smooth paths on them, you know, paths that a train could follow. Um, and ability condition, and let me just say that uh, that, that means that you can, there's a way to sprinkle in some extra arrows over this bigger algebra. The bigger algebra means that instead of just one, twos, and threes, I also have zeros. So I get a ton more arrows that has to satisfy some constraints, and those all give me a ton, you know, in this train track, it seems like I've made things a lot worse, but actually, I, I get lucky, and this actually cleans things up a little bit to add these extras, because notice that there's, there's a lot of these like two-way opposite oriented, the arrows are kind of unclear, but these are pair oppositely oriented edges, and I might as well just replace those with unoriented edges, like a two-way street. And it turns out that at each end of the horizontal and vertical segments, there's exactly one of those two-way streets. So if I just look at, there's some other stuff too, but there's 
there's those. And so if I just look at those, plus, I have a train track that is nice for me. It's immersed curves plus some other stuff. And, and the goal is to say whatever I can about that stuff. Um, you might wonder why I, I sort of scrunch things up into the top right corner. And the, and the reason that's convenient is um, we can pair two of these train tracks. And the way we do it is we reflect one of them down across this anti-diagonal. Um, and then we take uh, floor homology of that. So if you're careful, uh, emphasis if you're careful, you can define, it, it makes sense to define floor homology of train tracks. Um, count generators or intersection points, bygones like this. If the bygone follows the boundary, if the boundary of a bygone follows an oriented edge, it has to like ha be oriented from initial generator to final generator. Um, okay, and you can write this down. And the nice thing about having this in this form is like, the generator will happen in these two regions, which are really nice, and all the interesting stuff happens apart, so we don't interfere with each other. So because of that, we can actually identify this geometric pairing, this floor homology. We can explicitly identify it with that algebraic pairing from before, the box sensor product. Okay, so that's cool, um, I guess, you know, uh, because I've taken scary algebra and turned it into pictures. So at least if you're like me and prefer pictures to algebra, that's good. But you're probably sitting there saying, well, now I just have two different representations of some algebraic thing that you haven't defined for me. How am I supposed to know if it's any better? And at this point, it's um, or how much better it is. But, but here's, I think, where the, where the real win is, that by converting algebra to pictures, algebra brain, and turn on my topology brain, and I just start sliding things around until this picture looks better, right? Um, so in particular, like, maybe I'll and I'm going to slide it over to the right. And then there's some other one I'll slide over. Uh, basically, all these extra edges I slide out to the boundary of this top right quadrant. Um, OK, and I get to something that looks like this. Um, notice that uh, these, they've all paired off in these x's. And it's not an accident of this example. It's another consequence of this extendability condition that that will always happen. Um, so what I'm going to do for graphical shorthand is I'll replace an X like that with just a bold arrow. Um, so these, uh, I mean, these, these come up in real life train tracks, by the way. I, I think they're called scissor switches. The only difference is that mine are oriented, um, which is usually not the case for train tracks. But uh, OK, so great. I've, I'm, this picture is getting better and better, right? Now, you might, you might be hesitant because, well, like, when am, why am I allowed to do the right to be concerned, I, I, I pointed out that you have to be really careful when you define floor homology of train tracks. Um, in particular, you don't have to think about it very long to realize that homology of train tracks is not preserved by arbitrary homotopies of the train tracks. So I'm not allowed to just do whatever slide I want, but it turns out that there's sort of a set of slides that are the guiding principle is I want to do manipulations that are not going to affect the pairing with any other thing. Which means, since any other thing would go here when I pair, I can fairly safely modify things up here. OK. Having said that, the next step, I need to venture out of the safe zone. I'm going to take this arrow, and I'm going to push it around the torus between parallel curves. This also, it turns out, is OK. If I only pushed one of these, change the floor homology. But as long as I push these x's in pairs, it's OK. OK. So I can slide as long as they're parallel. Once they diverge, I can't slide because, oh, well, I should have mentioned the, the picture is missing the base point, but the base point is, the, is at the core of the square identified. I can't slide past the puncture. So this is a dead end. But I can turn around and go the other way. Um, and I have to stop when they diverge, but something interesting happens if when they diverge, if I happen to be moving clockwise, uh, it turns out that that arrow can't possibly contribute to the differential because any bygone involving it would have to cover the puncture. Um, again, I, you know, I have to say more about that, but Basically, if it's moving clockwise when they diverge, you can just delete it. So I started with three of these extra arrows. I'm down to two. Uh, let's try to get rid of this one. I'll slide it. Uh, until they diverge, it's going the wrong direction. So I have to go back the other way. Um, unfortunately, it's still going the wrong direction here, which is unfortunate. But the only way that it can be the wrong direction on both ends is if I passed a crossing somewhere. And it turns out there's another local move I can do that preserves floor homology that lets me resolve that crossing. Um, and then afterwards, these two arrows are oriented such that they can both be removed. Okay, so it's 
Formalizing this into an algorithm that always works is a little bit complicated. Okay, and now these are removed. Um, but the idea is it's pretty clear the strategy for removing any one arrow. You just push it until they diverge, and if it's the right direction, you delete it. That will always work uh, this arrow by pushing until the strands it connects diverge, they'll never diverge because they're parallel, right? I mean, I can play around, I can resolve this crossing just for like a matter of convention. Now I have two honestly parallel curves, but I can't get rid of those. And so that's where the algorithm stops. Um, they can't be removed, but I can interpret what's in the red as a local system. There's two parallel copies of the curve, so that's a dimension two local system. And the arrows I can interpret as an automorphism. You should think of that as like telling you how you jump the tracks as you go once around the curve. Um, so to sum up that example, um, you know, I started with this extendable type D structure, whatever this algebraic object is, and I turned it into this. A pair of curves in the torus, one of which is decorated with um, and or if you, if you wish, a dimension one trivial local system. Okay. So that's where these invariants come from. That was a lot to take in, but I hope you sort of um, okay, and that's enough for the slides. So, uh, this was not like this before, I think. I guess I just, um, okay, great. So, um, where was I with the board? I ended there, I guess. Um, okay, maybe I just mentioned that it, it, some of you spend some time thinking about the Fukai category and spe specifically the Fukai category of the tor, of, uh, sorry, of, of surface. If you have thought about those things, some of this stuff with curves and local systems might look familiar. Um, so, uh, you know, there are some other results these things and, and maybe the one most important um, there's a result of um, let's see Hayden Katsarkov and Kontsevich which um, I'll just say very crudely, but, but roughly it says um, objects in the Fukai category of a, of, a surf, of a punctured surface uh, can be viewed as um, decorated with local system. There's lots of ways of defining the, the category, and, and some of them are pretty algebraic as it is, but um, you know, one is using sort of twisted complexes over an algebra associated to this torus, and uh, actually for the torus, they, they equivalent to these type D structures. Garou was the first to observe that. And so in that sense, um, the, the, the train tracks I just showed you is sort of like another proof that recovers this result, or at least partially recovers this result. Um, but there's a couple things that are nice about it. This, this train track algorithm is, is very explicit, sort of very clear. Um, and because it's, and it stays in the language of third floor homology, like every step those train tracks encode a type D structure. Um, so I think even if you're interested in this result, I think our algorithm is like shed some valuable light on, on this result and also be it's so explicit and I could match up the pairing like I mentioned uh, we get our theorem too as well that, that the pairing that the algebraic pairing um, corresponds with the geometric pairing of this um, okay so that's just to say that you know there's other other related results that are worth comparing our algorithm to um, okay so I've told you, I've given you some examples of these curves. I've shown you roughly where they come from. Um, I'm gonna tell you just about properties of these curves very quickly. Um, 
you know, you could think of this as uh, our, our, our sort of structure theorem says that uh, any immersed curve system comes from some type D structure. But now not all of them come from manifolds. So some properties of things that come from manifolds. Well, one I already kind of alluded to um, when I was talking about lifting to the cylinder that was implicitly needed there. Uh, HF hat of M is homologous multiple of the homological longitude. Sorry, uh, yeah, I'm going to say each component of this set of curves is homologous, or if you prefer, think homotopic if I ignore the puncture. If I allow it to slide through the puncture, then it looks just like the homological longitude. Or before, if I ignore the punctures, they all just look like the solid torus curve that wraps straight around. Um, Okay, so that's nice. Um, there's another sort of, this is not true of all, uh, of all curves for manifolds, but it's a property that gives us some information about the curve. So a curve in T2 cross, I'm gonna say it's loop. Um, if it is, uh, if it, can be homotoped um, to a neighborhood of an immersed curve. Um, Okay, so here's some examples. Sorry, um, this makes no sense. Um, curve. Uh, embedded curves in torus are up to homotopy are just curves of lines, straight lines of rational slope. So that is a loose curve. Um, this one we saw before is loose. Um, this is not loose, although it looks similar. Okay, so I want it to be uh, in a neighborhood of an embedded curve that doesn't go through the puncture. So this one is you know, in a neighborhood of an embedded curve through the puncture, that doesn't count. Okay, the reason this is relevant is that Tom Gillespie showed that so if boundary of M is compressible, that's equivalent to so we get a nice sort of characterization of when something with torus boundary has incompressible boundary. Uh, in terms of the curves look like. Um, again, you know, this, this could be compared to um, Elishai and, and Lipschitz, who showed that in general for other boundary, um, bordered floor homology detects if the boundary is incompressible, and, and this is sort of a, a different characterization of, of what they show for the torus boundary case. Um, okay. Let's see, I'm just trying to make sure I collect all of the properties that I need and I want to end with. Um, there's one more. Um, HF hat of M, no peg wrapping. Um, a lot of sense, I'll explain it in a second, but um, what does this mean? It means that there's a puncture and, okay, the reason I say peg wrapping is uh, one convenient way to think about these curves is I like to think of them as there being a wooden peg at the punctures and the curve is a rope and I can pull it tight and that puts it sort of in its minimal position. Um, but what I don't want is I don't want 
like completely choke off the peg and, and wrap fully around like this. Um, so like when I pull tight, um, then it's not, it can't go more than a full 180 degree turnaround. Um, like strictly more than 180. I should mention that um, it can go, uh, we saw in the figure eight example, we can have this and uh, maybe this is like 180 degrees plus epsilon as I, as I make this go closer and closer. So what I mean is like significantly more than 180 degrees. Okay. Um, so this, uh, this follows from some restrictions on, on the topology, on some boundary degeneration arguments of holomorphic curves that define CFT. So this is a restriction on the type. And in terms of curves, it means we have no of these, none of these fish tails. Um, okay, so um, let's make sure I'm not forgetting anything blatantly. Um, Uh, okay, so I promise you that I, I promise you some applications, um, and sorry, I'm gonna. I promise you some applications. Uh, I only have eight minutes left. But I also promise you that the proofs would be very easy. That if we develop this formalism, then you know, we almost for free get some nice results. So let's see what, uh, what results I can show you in less than 10 minutes. And hopefully I can show you two. Um, OK, so the first is, uh, is another property of these curves, which gives symmetry. Um, so that, um, well, h of hat of m in some spin c structure of the curve um, is the same thing as h of hat of m in the conjugate spin c structure with this map f, uh, which is the elliptic evolution on the torus. Um, so if I take my curves and I apply the elliptic involution, which means basically rotate these pictures 180 degrees, I get back the same thing with conjugate spin c structures. In particular, um, if I add up, over, if I sum over all spin C structures to so just get the total invariant, uh, then that's fixed by the action of this 180 degree rotation. So geometrically, there's a, a, a symmetry that these curves have. Um, and this conjecture that this is true for, you know, proved in a couple of cases, not, but it's been kind of elusive. Um, but it, we sort of get the last ingredients using uh, these immersed curves. And um, let me just, well, let me tell you, uh, this will be a, more of a, a proof sketch because uh, the proof does involve computing a couple bygones and comparing them, which I'm not going to do here. But um, so proof, which is Osbeth and Thurston showed, there's a bimodule. Um, I'll call it A, and the experts um, the DA bimod of a particular Hager diagram called the AZ piece, uh, which stands for Aru Zarev, because they were the first to, I think they both independently used this piece. Um, but it doesn't matter what it is. There, there is a bimodule such that, you know, CFD of M, S, equals uh, this bimodule box tensored, so paired with this CFD of M S bar. Okay. Well, 
it's also easy to see that there is a bimodule that I'll call E for the action of the elliptic involution. Okay. Um, two bimodules are the same because then I'd be done, right? It would say that, well, if I do the elliptic involution or if I do spin C conjugation, I get the same thing. Unfortunately, they are not the same. Well, they're not, they're, they're, they're frustratingly close to being the same. It's the same, but they're not quite the same. And, and you can check, there's no homotopy equivalence between them. There are things you can tensor them with that give different answers. But, um, we now have a nice sort of classification of, of the type D structures that come from manifolds and we can describe them as these immersed curves. So we can check that the same on immersed curves with local act on the subcategory of type D structures that we care about. Well, that's, a, that's actually a slight lie. There's, one, there's exactly one curve that they act differently on. It's this curve that just wraps around the puncture, but this never happens from manifold because we ruled out peg wrapping. That's why I wanted that property. Okay. So, um, so this is a statement about the, the invariance of manifolds with boundary, but there's you know a corollary in terms of h of hat of y. So this is closed three manifold. Is invariant. Uh, under genus one mutation. What that means is you find any torus, uh, cut open that torus, and then re-glue by this elliptic involution. Okay, great. So um, that's sort of nice. This falls out almost for free. Um, I mean, there's some checking these bimodules, but it would be really hard to like systematically check, compare the action of two bimodules on arbitrary type D structures, but it's a lot easier to think about how they act. Okay, so the last application to motivate it, I'll just start with sort of a, a broad question. Um, when is H of hat of Y small? So, um, uh, when, it, when is it trivial in the sense that it, it's the same as the three sphere? So, what are or S threes? This is a natural question to ask for you know any three manifold invariants. What are the what are the manifolds that I can't distinguish from S three that, that look like S three with respect to this invariant? Um, okay, a fact that some of you may know: the answer is not just S three. So like Poincaré conjecture for Hager floor homology uh, because we know um, so S3 of course has this property um, but then the Poincaré sphere also has this property but the interesting fact is that we don't know any more examples essentially I mean uh, okay so we can have either orientation on the Poincaré sphere but these are the only examples uh, I guess I should say prime examples because I can take connect sums of them too but Okay, so um, this, it would be great. I mean, who knows? Are there only two or are there infinitely many we just haven't found? Um, this is definitely open in general. Um, but, you know, you could, you could consider if the manifold has some other kind of complexity, then we might hope that that translates to Haggard floor homology being. So, in, so here's relevant to. Uh, Something I can say uh, something about. 
if y has an essential so for instance if it's not geometric because we know every three manifold has a geometric decomposition but if, if you need to cut it into two or more pieces to have geometric pieces then it has some essential torus so that means it's got some complexity you'd maybe hope to expect that h of y is not too small um, okay and that turns out to be the case so so the theorem is that uh, if y um, will separating torus so I can cut it along the torus into two interesting pieces Well, then the dimension of h of hat um, of y is at least five. Okay. Um, how do you prove a statement like this? Well, so. Oh, and by the way, uh, the, the lower bound of five can be obtained. That's why I kept that example up. So we saw this earlier, right? So that's an example where we get five by splicing two trefoils. And we can actually enumerate all the ways to get five. There's only a couple. Um, okay, so how do we prove this? Well, it essentially follows from uh, a lemma, which is just completely elementary geometry of curves in a torus. Um, to be a little bit vague, sufficiently non-trivial curves, immersed curves in a punctured torus intersect times. Okay, and what do I mean by this? Uh, not loose. And I also peg wrapping, which I guess is not really a non-triviality, but it's a technical condition I need. So no peg wrapping. Okay, so the idea now is if I have a torus, I can cut along it. Um, I, I'm just gonna pick one component. It never has peg wrapping. Because it's incompressible, we know that I, there has to be at least one component that's not loose. So I can pick a component of each like this. And if you can prove this lemma, then you immediately get four, um, which is already an interesting result. And then Turns out, actually, there's only two ways you can get four. In one case, the curves are parallel, so they're not admissible. Uh, and in the other case, the homological longitude has uh, order at least two, and then you can check that that implies with some long exact sequence or something that, that there's a second spin C structure. So this one contributes four, but then, then there's at least another one contributing some more. Um, okay, so. A little more. And I guess I'm a little over time, so I'll, I'll leave this lemma as an exercise if you're motivated, uh, which probably aren't at the end of three weeks of summer school, but it really is kind of a fun and pretty simple, uh, um, just like geometry exercise. I guess, I guess I'll give you a quick hint that um, we might as well assume these curves are pulled tight because then they're uh, in minimal position. And the fact that they're not loose means when I pull tight, they have at least one corner. They catch on the peg somewhere because otherwise they wouldn't be loose. I guess I forgot to say that, but um, that's another way of characterizing loose. These things that pull tight to a straight line, they have no corners. They don't catch on the peg when you pull them straight, but if you're not loose, they have to catch somewhere. So you have at least one corner, but if you have one corner in your closed curve, you have at least two corners, and then you just look locally near a corner of the first curve and a corner of the second and check that on average, they have to intersect once. Okay, I'll stop there. So, um, well, okay, so it depends a little on the way you think about it, but 
Uh, something I didn't really highlight so much that's a, kind of a new feature of this HF hat of M as opposed to the CFD, the border invariant, is that, um, well, CFD depends on the parameterization I choose. Um, and then HF hat of M, if I draw it in a, in a square, that, that picture in the square depends on the parameterization. But then what I do is I map that into the boundary of the manifold by the parameterization. So if I think of this as a, a curve living in the boundary of the manifold, it actually doesn't depend on the parameterization at all. What matters is to draw that, uh, to draw the boundary of the manifold on the blackboard, I need to make a choice of parameterization. So what that means is that um, there's bimodules in bordered floor for any change of parameterization, but all of these, if you think of it as a curve in the boundary, you're just not doing anything to the curve, you're just changing how you draw that curve in the boundary. So whatever the rotation is, the curves are just gonna do that thing. So the elliptic involution, the curves is gonna, I mean, really, it's the same curves in the boundary. You're just drawing the boundary rotate. And then if you rotate 90 degrees, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, so the thing that comes to mind is may not be quite what you look. We can, we can, it's very easy to understand when, like, when you get L spaces and when you don't. Um, uh, and, you know, you have some curve, um, like, let's say the trefoil. It looks like this, um, and I would intersect a bunch of different lines, and I get L spaces whenever you know they only intersect once, um, and you can check that that sort of corresponds to being tangent or not tangent to the curve. So the, the you get this sort of set of slopes that give L space surgeries uh, is what's the complement of the set of uh, tangent slopes to this curve which then immediately tells you that's like a closed connected interval, for instance. Um, you can read off, this is, Jake talked about this, some of this last week, but um, you, can, uh, you can sort of read off um, the boundary slopes of that interval um, in, in a certain way. Um, so we, we can say a lot about L spaces, about like when you get L space surgeries, but I think maybe it would be interesting to say more about, okay, non L spaces, how do I know when I go from having two extra or four extra or six extra Generated. Um, so, uh, is there a way to Yeah, yeah. So the Thurston norm. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that we can detect. Um, uh, and and the way that you detect the Thurston norm is you have longitude here, and you look in this torus, and you know here's like uh, t t two five, I believe. Uh, not complement you're detecting genus, but in general you're detecting Thurston norm. And you know, relative to the longitude horizontal, you look at the highest and the lowest height that you achieve. That's a 